Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, a podcast about early American history with Liz Covart. The study of history is key to understanding who we are and how we can affect a better future. Ben Franklin's World will introduce you to historical people and events that have impacted and shaped our present-day world. And now, here's your host, Liz Covart. Hello, and welcome to Episode 4 of Ben Franklin's World podcast dedicated to helping you learn how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present-day world we live in. Each week, we sit down with an historian to discuss their unique insights into our early American past so we can learn more about who we are and how we can affect a better future. So I'm excited to offer you episode four, which is near and dear to my heart. It is the very first episode I recorded. In today's episode, we chat with Thomas A. Foster, author of Sex and the Founding Fathers, The American Quest for a Relatable Past. Tom wrote a great book, and he was a gracious guest who demonstrated a lot of patience with me as I conducted our interview. I admit that I spent the entire interview nervous about whether or not my software would record, even though I had tested it beforehand. Plus, Tom wrote a good book, which I enjoyed, and I really wanted to conduct an interview that would do his research justice. Needless to say, I learned a lot from this interview. First and foremost, like I need to relax when I conduct them. So although I may sound nervous, Tom provides great information about the ideas and information in his book, such as why Tom thinks Americans are fascinated by the founding fathers in their private lives, examples of how Americans have imagined and reimagined the private lives of the founding fathers from the 18th century to the present, and how biographies of the founders often reveal more about the author's generation than about the true characters of the founders they portray. But before we get to this conversation with Tom, I have something I would like to share with you, a modern-day discovery. After studying all the best available news, foreign and domestic, Liz has a modern-day discovery to share with you. Now, as you may be aware... A group of Boston men dressed like Indians tossed 342 chests of tea into Boston Harbor on the night of December 16, 1773. The Boston Tea Party led to severe sanctions against the city of Boston and the colony of Massachusetts Bay, which in turn led to armed conflict and the War for American Independence. What you may not know is that each year on the evening of December 16, you can attend a reenactment of the Boston Tea Party at the Old South Meeting House in Boston. I attended the reenactment last year, on December 16, 2013, and I had so much fun. Men and women crowd into the Old South Meeting House, and a group of reenactors set the scene of the tea debate. After the reenactors' debate, they open the floor to the audience. Now, a few brave souls get up there and they ad lib their views but most of us just read the slip of paper a staff member handed us on our way in. That slip of paper reflects the name, or I should say it provides the name of a Bostonian who lived in 1773 and their views on the Tea Act. Now, a real debate emerges because everybody has a different point of view, and this allows you to be able to really picture and imagine what the tea debate was like in December 1773. After a good period of debate, the reenactors reappear, and at the end of their debate, Samuel Adams, or the reenactor who plays Samuel Adams, stands up and he announces, This meeting can do nothing more to save our country! At that point, the Sons of Liberty march out, as does the crowd, including you. You follow them down to the Boston Tea Party Party Museum ships, where you will witness the Sons of Liberty reenactors dumping the real tea into Boston Harbor. Yes, you heard me right. Real tea into Boston Harbor. So this reenactment is pretty close to the original, or at least what historians have determined the original debate was like. Now, to go to the annual Tea Party reenactment, you will have to buy a ticket, and this event always sells out. Tickets are on sale now at www.osmh. Dot org slash calendar slash annual dash reenactment. Now, you don't have to remember this address because I'm going to post a link to it in the show notes. Now, if you buy your tickets prior to November 1st, they're $20. And if you purchase them after November 1st, they're $25. 
But if you wait till after November 1st, you're taking a real gamble because, as I said, this event always sells out. Now, full disclosure, this event is only for the hardy and the well-bundled. Boston can be very cold in mid-December, and half of the event takes place outside. So you'll want to bring your warmest jacket, your mittens, hats, gloves, whatever. You may even want a st- stadium seat pad because you're going to watch the Sons of Liberty reenactors dump the tea while seated on metal bleachers. But it's still a lot of fun. You'll be cold, but you're going to have a blast. So. If you are curious, the Old South Meeting House did not put me up to this. They did not ask me to advertise their event, but I wanted to tell you about it because I just discovered it last year and I had so much fun. I think it is an event that every history lover should attend if they can. So there you have it. That's my modern day discovery, and I hope you get a chance to make it up one year to the annual Boston Tea Party event. With tidings and wisdom to share about our early American past, Here is this week's special guest. Joining us today is Thomas Foster, a professor of history at DePaul University in Chicago, Illinois. Tom's research interests include early America, the American Revolution, and the history of sexuality. He has authored numerous essays and op-eds and two books, Sex and the Founding Fathers, The American Quest for a Relatable Past, and Sex and the 18th Century Man, Massachusetts and the History of Sexuality in America. Tom is also an editor. He's edited four books on gender and sexuality in early America, most recently Women in Early America, which is forthcoming in February 2015 from the New York University Press. If you like to tweet, you can find Tom on Twitter, too. He can be followed at Thomas A. Foster. Welcome to the show, Tom. Thanks. It's great to be here. So today we're going to be talking about your latest book, Sex and the Founding Fathers, which has quite the provocative title. How did you develop an interest in early America and in the history of sexuality in particular? I uh, came to the history of sexuality in early America as an undergraduate, actually, uh, in a class with Mary Beth Norton. It was at the time that she was working on founding mothers and fathers that she was teaching this course. And I just instantly uh, gravitated to the subject uh, and the time period. So. I was not a history major, but when I went on to graduate school, I knew I was going to pursue uh, um, a degree in early American history, and specifically women's history and the history of sexuality. Great. That's really interesting. It's nice to you know, know that there's others who get a kick out of their college classes and just wish to pursue the, their interest in history. Well, I think if they're taught by Mary Beth Norton, maybe that's likely to happen. So. Yeah, she's an incredible scholar. Right, right. So in Sex and the Founding Fathers, Tom asserts that since the time of the nation's founding, Americans have tried to understand their founding fathers by looking into their private lives. Tom, why do you think Americans are obsessed with the founding fathers in their private lives? One of the things that I discovered as I did this research in looking at popular discussions about the founding fathers' private lives and tracing those um, from their lifetimes to the present was... uh, an overarching interest in their personal lives as a way to understand the true individual. And this changes over time. Uh, So initially there is an interest, say, in their domestic lives or in in individuals as heads of households. And later it becomes more about psychological um, interiority or them as psychologically healthy men in terms of their romantic interests. And then today maybe we're in sort of what I had called the warts and all uh, period where we want to understand them uh, with less of a sense of it being varnished or hidden or um, secrets not being told, right? I mean, we consider ourselves a more sophisticated audience. We want to know that some of the nitty gritty details, some of us do. So I think overall, even though those things change overall, there's a sense that you can learn something about the true individual by understanding how they loved uh, or what their intimate lives were like. Uh, I argue in the book that this is problematic because understandings of sex and romance change so dramatically over time. Uh, But I think popular audiences still have a sense that this is sort of an accessible uh, avenue to the individual, love and romance. Very interesting. And this uh, shift between the different views over time um, of how we're trying to relate to the founding fathers um, is an interesting question, and it reminds me of something you said in your introduction. Um, Tom writes that, quote, 
Each generation has asked different questions about the founders and their private lives, but Americans have consistently imagined and reimagined the private lives of the founders through the lens of contemporary society. End quote. Tom, what do you mean by that? And can you give us an example of how Americans have imagined and reimagined a founding father's private life? Sure. So,、uh, as I mentioned, the questions change over time.、Uh, so that,、uh, as I've already referenced in the、uh, 19th century, there's an interest in their domestic lives. There's not the kinds of questions that people ask today.、Uh, take Washington for example. People are interested、uh, sometimes today when they hear that he didn't have children with Martha.、Uh, they want to know why. That kind of question was not being asked in the 19th century. Certainly not in、uh, print、uh, public discussions、um, and representations of Washington. So that's a new question that emerges more recently. So that's just an example of what I mean. That different questions are asked by different generations.、Uh, what ends up happening then is you end up with different founding fathers for different generations. And so, uh, for uh, to take another example, Governor Morris,、uh, who not a lot of people、um, know, but Governor Morris、uh, had、uh, a very active sex life outside of marriage. He wasn't married until he's fifty-seven. So this is a non-marital sex life with. Uh, married women with single women. He writes about this in his diaries, but people in the 19th century, when they talk about Morris, simply talk about him as a bachelor、uh, and sort of a sociable bachelor. This is not entirely surprising that they would do this, but nonetheless, that's the Morris that people look at and see today. When they look at Morris,、uh, now that they know much more about him、uh, and his、uh, life、uh, as an elite man in the late 18th century, what some would call sort of a libertine、uh, life. Or a more indulgent lifestyle, we have just a different view of Morris, right? And so he he changes over time for individuals. The same is said for the under, other individuals、uh, in the book. Jefferson is a, another good example of that. Yeah, Governor Morris is an interesting character, and we have to admit he's not really a household name. So, who was Governor Morris,、um, and why is, why do you think he's not as popular、um, with Americans as founders such as Washington, Jefferson, or Adams? Governor Morris. Uh, is probably best known as the individual that wrote the "We the People"、uh, preamble to the Constitution. He, he styled the Constitution, so he served as an editor and a, a, a style writer for it.、Uh, he is、um, a, a U.S. senator. He's an ambassador. He, he holds a number of different roles that are significant、um, in the、uh, formation of the nation. He's not a household name, which is kind of an interesting uh, thing uh, to ponder. Some writers have、um, looked at him as an aristocrat,、uh, and that that makes him sort of an unappealing founder for many.、Uh, I, for me, I was interested in how he didn't fit sort of norms and ideals of manhood,、uh, especially in terms of sexuality. So, so he is sort of, a, a, I think, a hard individual for people to. Uh, rally around、um, and and make an icon. It's obviously, speculation about why this all happens,、um, but it's it is interesting that he is not as well known as others. That's interesting that you kind of picked him because he he is unique. Because I was wondering,、um, you have six chapters in Sex and the Founding Fathers,、um, and each one profiles a different founding father. And included, you have George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, Benjamin Franklin, Alexander Hamilton, and Governor Morris. So I was curious, you know, how you went about selecting which founders to include in your book. It's a good question,、uh, and there could have been others. I think I mentioned in the introduction that this exercise could be done with other founders.、Uh, there's one exception, though, to that point, or one important、uh, difference there is that I wanted to focus, for the most part, on icons、uh, because there's a book being made about. Uh, the symbolic value of understanding their personal lives or representing their personal lives for how we think about、uh, the nation or how、uh, the culture depicts the nation. So, so for me, it was important to go with the icons.、Uh, Governor Morris doesn't fit, obviously, with that, but I could not resist including him because of these detailed diaries that he left, and, there, and I did want to include a few founders that were lesser known so that people could.、Um, Learn more about them. There was a chapter on Burr that got cut、uh, to keep the book、uh, at a shorter, more affordable length, and that、uh, chapter I'm almost certain is going to come out in the fall with、uh, Commonplace blog in a reduced form. 
What had attracted you to Aaron Burr? Well, Aaron Burr uh, fits well, you know, with the other founders also. I mean, he's very well known, um, obviously, and he has uh, quite uh, an interesting um, story arc in terms of his um, sexual reputation. So uh, that that essay will be out in the fall. Great. Um, we'll definitely uh, try to put a link or at least a reminder in the show notes um, so people can find that. Yeah, it'd be great. I'm sure most people, uh, listeners, are aware of uh, the Commonplace blog. If they're not, they should definitely check it out. And the Commonplace blog, that's put out um, in conjunction with the American Antiquarian Society, correct? Or is that a uh, that's right. I believe so. Okay. Great. And it is a wonderful um, resource. Yep. So, so as you were writing this book, which founding father did you find most interesting to learn about and why? <sighs> it's a great question. Uh, and it's true that I actually found them all very interesting. So it sounds like a nice answer to give when you uh, are talking about your own book, but I didn't, I didn't get tired of uh, the stories about the individuals because I'm not actually writing about their sex lives. Uh, It's kind of a different question that you're asking me. And so what I end up thinking about is uh, the changes that their depictions go through. And then also just the energy that people write with as they're imagining their personal lives. So, you know, Gouverneur Morris immediately comes to mind uh, because he's such an interesting individual and there's so much primary source material to work with. And as an historian, I find that fascinating uh, primary source in terms of his own personal writings. And George Washington isn't the first thing that comes to mind when you think about sex and the founding fathers. But honestly, uh, the the story arc for George Washington, I found um, very interesting as I worked on it. I was especially struck by uh, the romantic writings that are done, you know, the romanticized view of his marriage to Martha, for example, uh, or the lengths that some popular writers will go to in sort of spinning yarns really about these individuals. That's what uh, held my interest in working on this book. And that's what I found so interesting. I mentioned that this is about, uh, it's really mostly about popular culture. So the book has been called historiography it's not what I think of in terms of historiography, because when I think of historiography, I tend to think of what academic historians have written about a topic. Uh, it's in a historiography in that it is tracing the histories of these individuals. But again, it's, it's an interest in popular stories, popular culture. So these are uh, popular writers for the most part. And it's true you're not just writing about um, their private lives as much as you're writing about or you wrote about um, how people – throughout history have perceived their private life. And and, um, in your book, you contend that gender and sexuality are important components of civic and national identity for Americans. Um, And I'm curious if you could explain a little bit more about how gender and sexuality figure into American civic and national identity. Uh, Sure. I mean, this is something that um, many other scholars have written about and done a much better job than I could ever do (laughs) with the topic. But I mean, it's, especially scholars of the history of sexuality uh, have shown all the ways that how the nation understands itself, how Americans think about themselves or think about the nation uh, is uh, not simply about how people think about our political institutions, even though that's sort of the first thing that people think about. It's, it's also obviously uh, completely uh, infused with uh, race and class and gender and sexuality and religion, uh, you name it. There's all sorts of ways, right, that culturally our understanding of uh, who are um, Americans, what is America, uh, is um, infused with all these other elements, these cultural elements. And so my particular interest, obviously, is in gender and sexuality. You say that it figures in, that gender and sexuality figures in. Um, do Americans do that by defining themselves by who they are not, gender and, and sexuality-wise? Yeah, I think that's that's often one of the classic ways of doing this, right? Who they are not. So uh, to take an example that many people would be familiar with probably uh, would be from the Cold War, uh, to think about the American nuclear family, right, with all of its race and class implications. But the American nuclear monogamous family um, in juxtaposition to um, communist society, right? So that, so that is about who we are and who we are not. Um, to take another example, um, you could look at uh, how abolitionists wrote about uh, the horrors of slavery when they talked about the violation of uh, enslaved people's families or particularly the rape of enslaved women. There you have an image 
uh, of, um, or you have an example of how sexuality is informing questions about who we are as a nation. And if abolitionists are saying, in fact, there's an hypocrisy to who we are, or we're not living up to the ideals of the nation, uh, it's sex and sexuality are, in fact, um, an important part of that discussed time. Now, as a follow-up, how can we use the private lives of the founders to explore the role of sexuality and gender, um, and how that plays into our national identity? Right. So, as I mentioned, I, I wanted to focus on uh, the the icons, sort of the, the best known individuals, because for me, they symbolize. I shouldn't say for me, for everyone. It's sort of an obvious point. They symbolize the nation. So, when someone is looking at the romantic life uh, in a biography of uh, George and Martha, or they're talking about uh, the sex life of uh, Alexander Hamilton. They're not just talking about that individual, right? There's there's this sort of uh, broader uh, cultural work that's being done that is about the nation itself, and by looking at formative uh, periods for the nation, you know, who built the nation, which in itself is a problematic question, right? That historians have done a great job showing that it's not just these founding fathers, but because we're talking about this level of cultural symbolism, uh, it's impossible to get away from that sort of resonance, right? So when you're talking about um, sexuality or the private lives, the intimate lives of the founding fathers, it's, it's always, I would argue, uh, it, it intimately bound up with and having uh, implications for uh, symbolism and understanding of the nation itself. And that question of who built the, the nation is a very interesting one. And I, I must say, I really enjoyed reading Sex and the Founding Fathers, but it did leave me with an Abigail Adams-like moment. Uh-huh. Now, although Tom mentioned several of the Founding Fathers in his book, I kept wondering how Americans have perceived our Founding Mothers and what role they play in our American conceptions of national identity. So, Tom, yeah. let's remember the ladies. Do the Founding Mothers play a role in American conceptions of national identity? And if so, how? An interesting question for me, uh, and, uh, and uh, um, it's fascinating for me to, to uh, hear you have this response to the book. So, I I came at uh, let's see, I came at studies of gender and sexuality via women's history and women's studies, and so I had an understanding that there's been this you know long-standing traditional understanding of women as as domestic as women associated with uh, the private realm right, with the romantic realm in these, especially in these stories of uh, the founding, right? I mean, they, they appeared uh, early on in popular ways as associated with their husbands. So for me, my emphasis, my work on masculinity um, was going to be about how sex, in fact, informed understandings of manhood. And that's um, also what my uh, earlier work is on in terms of um, uh, sex in the 18th century, my man, my previous uh, book. So I wanted to focus on the men and not, and not uh, actually go for what I think has already been well understood, that there is, in fact, another story here, right? The one that you're, you're asking about, remembering the ladies. So does that make sense? So what I'm arguing is, in fact, um, what I'm trying to do is complicate our understanding of how uh, manliness and masculinity has informed our uh, image of the founding fathers, taking into account sex and sexuality, which is so often uh, sort of stripped from the story of men uh, and really associated with uh, the realm of uh, women and womanhood. And there's, I should say, there's obviously excellent work on the flip side, uh, looking at women's lives and how, in fact, this idea that they're tied only to the domestic uh, and operating only in private realms is is entirely um, problematic and and false. And in fact, there's all sorts of ways in the public realm that, that women are operating um, and important. Yeah, I guess it's true. And um, for whatever reason, when you think of gender and sexuality, at least when I think of the of all the books I read in graduate school, um, they tend to have, you know, bring up thoughts of like female identity and domesticity. Um, but your book is very different in that you're talking about the same topics, but referencing men. Um, exactly, so that was, right. That was very interesting. So when you finished the book, did you come away um, having been particularly fascinated by the ways one particular founder had been remembered um, throughout history or walk away having a new found appreciation for a particular founding father? We haven't talked about Jefferson yet, actually. I was thinking um, that 
I think I had mentioned earlier that Washington sort of fascinated me in the way that he becomes a subject in a few places of almost like romance novel uh, type material that I found really interesting. Jefferson, uh, I wasn't so much interested in uh, the debates uh, and the history of those debates around the paternity of Sally Hemings's uh, children or paternity with Sally Hemings's children. I was interested in uh, the way that people imagine and reimagine uh, the nature of that relationship. The, the, the thing that we really can't uh, ever get at um, because we don't have the source material to ever really give us that full understanding of what that relationship uh, would have been like for Jefferson and also for Sally Hemings. Uh, and so I, I think I found that most interesting um, and am still struck by, uh, again, the, the uh, the need to imagine a particular relationship and then the implications that that has uh, for understanding Jefferson and, again, for understanding uh, the nation. Not that any founder is particularly easy to understand, but at least when I read his writings, you know, Adams tends to be very straightforward and you know exactly what he's thinking, where Jefferson tends to be a little more coy. Um, so he is a, you know, I can imagine that carrying over into his private life as well. Mm-hmm. Well, this discussion has been a lot of fun, and I do really want to respect your time. Um, so as we only have a few minutes left, it means it's time for the time warp. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> this is a fun segment where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. So are you ready? Sure. The time warp. Historians can't predict the future, but they can speculate about what might have been. Okay, so in your opinion, what might have happened if George Washington had fathered sons? Do you think that Washington would have resigned after just two terms as president? And would the United States have developed a hereditary presidency? <laughs> okay, this is great. I um the time warp is great. Uh, it's a great question. Uh, there's been plenty of speculation about what would have happened if Washington had fathered sons. Uh, I, I think it's hard to imagine, what we, given what we know about Washington, um, that he would have acted any differently and that he would have raised his sons uh, any differently in terms of their orientation uh, to the nation and to the office of the president. But who knows what those sons would have done right on their own or wanted to do on their own. Uh, for me, I know what we would have missed out on, and that is all these great stories about why Martha and uh, George didn't have uh, any children together. Uh, we would have missed out on all that. Is there a particular story that comes to mind about why they didn't have children that, that you'd like to share? Well, there's all sorts of speculation, so, and it ranges from, even though she had had children uh, pre from a previous marriage, um, from it being uh, a medical issue that she suffered from, or is it a medical issue that he suffers from that some write about, uh, or were there other uh, issues involved? Uh, and it's uh, it's also worth um, pointing out that, in fact, he, he may well have had sons. Uh, there is a family history, oral history about uh, him fathering a son with um, an enslaved woman, uh, West Ford. So uh, there's plenty of uh, speculation and uh, oral history and traditional history out there. I guess we'll always be left with wonder in terms of it what seems that way. Yeah. Yep. Well, this has been great, but before we conclude, can you tell us a bit about what's on the horizon for you? What should we be on the lookout for next? Oh, um, thanks. I, um, Let's see. I, you mentioned an edited volume that I have coming out on women in early America. It's coming out with NYU Press in February. So I'm looking forward to uh, that project uh, being wrapped up and, and coming out. Uh, it's um, been a real pleasure to work on. And uh, my research project right now is on the sexual exploitation of enslaved men. Uh, I've been working on developing and expanding an article that I wrote for the Journal of the History of Sexuality. Uh, it was published a couple of years ago on that topic. So I've been working on developing that into my next monograph. So if people want to find out more information about you and your work or possibly how to get in contact with you, where should they go? Uh, they could find me at the uh, History Department website for DePaul University. I maintain a 
website there where they uh, post my recent um, op-eds or um, journal articles or whatever else is going on. Uh, and you mentioned Twitter. Uh, people can follow me on Twitter uh, at Thomas A. Foster. That sounds great. And I hope people will get in touch um, as I have tweeted with you and you tweet back, which is always uh, always fun. I've enjoyed that. So, Tom, we've enjoyed chatting with you. Um, we wish you the best of luck with your research. And thank you for joining us on Ben Franklin's World. Great. I've really enjoyed speaking with you. Uh, thanks very much. I know I sounded nervous, but I enjoyed my interview with Tom. He offered us great insight into just how much the biographies and histories we read and write reflect the generation in which we live. I also enjoyed the details he provided about Governor Morris, a founder that I admittedly don't think about very often. When was the last time you thought about Governor Morris? You can find information about Tom, his new book, Sex and the Founding Fathers, plus everything we talked about today, including our modern-day discovery of the Boston Tea Party reenactment, on the show notes page for this episode, which you'll find at benfranklinsworld.com slash 004. If you enjoyed today's show, please tell your friends about us. We won't be listed in Stitcher or iTunes until December, so please send them to benfranklinsworld.com where they can discover more about the show and download all of our episodes. And finally, if you have any questions, comments, or suggestions about the show or what I could do to improve the show, please reach out. You can send me an email to liz at benfranklinsworld.com or tweet me. I'm always active on Twitter. My handle is Liz Kovart. Well, thank you for joining me. I look forward to speaking with you again on our next episode of Ben Franklin's World. And remember, never leave till tomorrow that which you can do today. <laughs>